Folks, we're going to start a new series. And it's called The Matters of the Heart. And as I read through scripture and I go over it and I go over it, so many places we see issues of your heart. And we see the matters in which our heart. And that word heart, okay, it means your inner person, who you really are. So when we really dig into this, and I don't know how long this series is going to take. It might take us all the way in, into Christmas. Now we're going to talk about the issues and the matters of who we really are. And what comes from our heart. And what shows up from our heart. And we, we're going to see it in today's intro to this this series, I am pumped about this series. I want you to be consistent in this series because every week, <laughs> every week you're going to be challenged. Listen, we just come, we sing great songs, and we come before God in absolute worship to give Him praise and to honor Him and to thank Him and to praise Him. And then we dig into this amazing book, which is the absolute Word of God, which is absolutely true, which is without error, and this is our faith. And we know that, God, you have delivered this to us so that we may know you and we may know your plan and we may know your guidance and we may know your protection and we may know who we are to be. I'm telling you what, I'm going to challenge you in the next six weeks for when 2013 shows up. You are not the same. That you are not the same. Folks, we love you so much and we care for you so much that we want God to show up in your lives that when you inspect this book and you inspect these pages and you look through these pages and then something comes across in your life, you're saying, wow, God, I don't line up to this. And I know you love me and I know that you're good and I know that you have the best for me and I know that you know my future, you know my next year, you know my next five years, you got to the absolute moment that I have my last breath, Father, you got this. And I want to rearrange my life according to your word. Could you imagine if we have a church that people understand this word is our lifeline and it is who we are to be. And then when we see that the issues of our heart don't line up with where God wants our heart to be, that we are quick to say, God, you got it. You got, I'm in. I surrender. You're my Lord. You're my King. Jesus, I bow down to you. I made that confession that you are King. I made that confession that you are Lord. And I meant it. And I'll obey. Rubber meets the road stuff for the next maybe six weeks. And I want you to be consistent. I want you to get into this because this is so real. And this is life-changing stuff. Two places that we're going to turn this morning. The two places we're going to turn is Proverbs 4.23 and 1 Samuel 16.7. Turn to 1 Samuel 16.7, put a marker in 1 Samuel. If you go to the Old Testament, towards the beginning of the Old Testament, you go to the first and seconds, you'll find it right there. There's three first and seconds, and it's the first one. So find 1 Samuel, hit it, and then turn over to Proverbs 4 and meet me at Proverbs 4, please. Father, I'm asking that your presence in this place, that we are put all of our attention on you. God, this is your time. This is your time. God, I thank you for the people who choose to be here. And God, because we choose, it's our choice to be here. That we would be ready and that we would be open and that, Father, by your spirit, you'd move in this place and show us who you are. Give us a, a greater picture of, of who you are in our lives this morning. God, I'm asking that every eye in this place would be open to see what they need to see. God, every ear in this place would have a very clear understanding, clearing out the issues, clearing out the circumstance of their days, just that they would have such a clarity in their mind that they would really understand what's necessary this morning for them personally, each one personally. And God, that our heart would be wide open and would be a sponge this morning and that our faith would increase today. Father, I believe your word is that powerful. I believe it can shatter like a hammer. I believe it is the lifeline. I believe it can bring joy and peace. I believe that it encourages and builds us, us up, God. Father, it is alive and powerful. And God, it is effective to those who will look at this and say, I believe it. I believe it. It's effective in my life. I believe it. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, we're going to be talking about the matters of the heart. Now look at this, verse 23 of Proverbs 4. Watch over your heart with all diligence. Circle that word watch. Watch over your heart. Let me show you the definition of heart. This is what we're talking about for the next, who knows. And I want you to get this. The heart, when you see the word heart, 
in Scripture, it's talking about the inner person. It's talking about your feelings, your affections, your passions, your desires, your courage. When you break it down, when you're saying, okay, what are the issues of my heart? You're saying, who am I really? Who really am I? Not what people think I am. <laughs> Not what my outside says I am. But my inner person. Who I really am. That's your heart. So look, this is so critical because right here in Proverbs, it tells us a serious, serious matter. It says to watch. That word watch, it means to guard. It means to protect. Listen, when God is telling you to protect something or guard something, this is like a military stance term. Like we are going to stand against and we are going to protect and we are going to guard our, our area and anyone who comes against it will meet death. That's what this term means. It is a fighting term. It is an aggressive word that says to guard, to watch, to protect. Listen, any military who is, their assignment is to protect and guard. And they say, oh, oh, the enemy's here. Come right in, please. Uh, you failed. Bad day. Protect with everything that you are. Do you realize uh, that attack on our embassy? This is huge. There were two Navy SEALs who heard about this attack. They traveled over to the embassy. And they stood their guard, protect that enemy for seven hours. Two against many. Listen, when I see that picture and I'm looking at this, saying, God, you're telling me to protect, to guard as a military term. Don't let anything in at all cost. Give your life for the cause. That's what this word means. So you got to know this right off the bat, that the importance of your heart, the things that are within your heart, God takes very serious. And God says you need to be aggressive and you need to protect because what's your heart is who you really are. And the things that are in your heart really define who you really are. And God knows that and he said, listen, you need to stand against at all cost and guard your, your inner person and protect your inner person. What goes in, folks, comes out. What you allow in comes out. He says this. This is great. Protect or guard or watch your heart with all diligence. That word diligence, it means intensity. It means with perseverance, with intensity. This is where the fighting term comes from. When we look at this and say, God, I will be intense in my stance. I will, be per I will persevere. Nothing is getting past this right here. When God says, listen, be intense, be, be this persistence, that you've you got to understand the importance of, of your heart, and he says to protect it with intensity, with everything you've got. Go to battle to protect your heart. Do whatever necessary. Take every necessary means to do whatever it takes to stand guard, to protect your heart. Why is that so critically important? Why is he making it uh, unmistakable in how we're to protect our heart? Because look at the second part. For, for from it flow the springs of life. Your version might say the issues of life. You know where life comes from, folks? You know where the issues are like? You know of who you really are comes from? It comes from your heart, that inner person. Your passions, your desires, your affections, they come from within. And when he's saying this, when he's looking at this, when God is telling us in Proverbs, the wisest man who ever walked the planet besides Jesus Christ was Solomon, and he writes this for us. He says, for from your heart comes who you really are. This is, this is huge. Turn to 1 Samuel 16. So when we are getting into this series, and we're talking about the matters of the heart, Folks, I will be very specific and very direct in our messages in regards to who we really are because it will challenge you. And please, we love you and we want you here and I want you to be so consistent because I know how great God is and I know how good God is and I know that when we follow his plan and we start right and we stay right, we will end right. And there will be favor from God and blessing from God and we will have, we will, we will have the, the guidance of God and he will protect us and he will be our refuge and our strength 
It is amazing to me that we want all that, but yet we still do it our way. I see what scripture says, but nah. Well, you just let the enemy right in. And I tell you what, this is, these are messages. I want to bless you. I want you to be encouraged and built up. But there are times that people will come to church and they will be so pumped about church and so excited about church. And then we'll hit something that God is very clear on that they disagree with and then you never see them again. <laughs> what? <laughs> what happened? I want you to stick with it and I want you to see it and say, God, I want that right there. Look at this now, 1 Samuel 16. Point number one to this is this. I want you to know number one, that God looks at the heart. We just worship the great creator, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And going into this message this morning, you have to know that the creator, all-powerful God, he's looking at your heart. Look at this, 1 Samuel 16. Here you got a, a time and season in history when God was, was overruling. And then the people of Israel rejected God, turned their back on God, lost their fear and reverence for God, and they said, we want a king to overrule us. We want a king that we can submit ourselves to. And God is like, I'm your king, but you've rejected me. I'll grant your request. Gives him a king, first king in Israel, Saul, right? God anoints Saul as king. Saul blows it. Saul's disobedient. Saul walks his own way. God's commanded him to do some things. Saul says, nope. God says, you're done. And he brings, he brings Samuel in the prophet to go to the house of Jesse. Look at this, verse 16. I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Since I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. Samuel, knock it off. Get up and go. This is what he's saying. Stop grieving. I've rejected him. I've told you that. Get up and get on it. This is what he's saying. And I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. Look at this. Verse, verse 6. Samuel shows up. He shows up to the house of Jesse, and then he, and then he walks in. Now look at this, this is it. Verse 6 says this. When they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord has anointed him. And here he says, okay, Jesse, this is the deal. I need all your sons to come before me. And he starts with the firstborn son, Eliab. So Eliab shows up. Now look at this. This is great. So when they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said, God pipes in and says, you know what, Samuel? Do not look at his, his appearance or at the height of his statue. Don't look that he's a firstborn son. Don't look at the height of his statue. Don't look that he's got broad shoulders. Don't look that he's a good looking dude. That's what he's saying. Don't look at that. Look at this. This is huge. We've got to see this. If we're talking about the matters of the heart, check God out. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance. God doesn't look and see what man sees. The Bible says, but God looks at the heart. Folks, how many times do we look at the car we drive, at the house we live in, in the neighborhood that we belong in, and we think we've arrived? And how many times do we look at the outward appearance and think, well, that guy has kept his weight, and that guy has worked out, and that guy... And yet on the inside of that guy, or on the inside of that girl, is rottenness and destruction. But we see right here. This is about as far as we see. And we see and understand that we live by and through a God who doesn't look at that outside. And very clearly he says, don't look at how big he is or how broad he is or how tall he is or how good looking he is or he's the firstborn because I don't look at that. God says, I look at the heart. I look at the heart. I look at who the inner person is. I look at who he is from the inside out. Isn't that amazing that we have a God that isn't going to look at us on our weight, on our height, on our color, on how much hair we have or don't have. He's not going to look at the amount of teeth that we have in our mouth. He's going to look at the issues of our heart. We got to get that, folks. We got to get that because we can be a shallow bunch at times. 
The church can be a shallow bunch at times. And we can become so critical. I got to say, would you just look deeper than that? Would you look at those who are broken? And would you look at those who are hurting? And you look at those who've been abandoned? I want them right there. Don't look at where they live. Don't look at their address. Don't look at their, the vehicle they drive. Don't look at the job they have. Don't look at the financial bank account. Look at the heart. Folks, we want people to come in this church that are broken, that are hurting, that are messed up, that are crying out, God, I need to change. God, would you do something? I want a group of people that aren't going to look at the outside and see that I have a heart that is willing to submit to God, that is broken, and that is hurting. If we would fill this place, we'd have to go to a service every night if we would get this, folks. I'm telling you, that's, that is what we want, is broken, hurting people, because we're a family here that looks at them and says, I see your heart, and I love you, and I care for you, and God has a plan for you, and God values you, and God cares for you, because we're not a shallow bunch, and we won't have a shallow bunch here. We want to look at people and their heart, that have, have a heart for God, that are broken, that have been abandoned. that others have rejected. I say, God loves you. And God knows what's in your heart. Folks, this is huge for us. God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Number one, the Lord looks at the heart. I want you to see this, please. First Kings. First Kings 8, 39. Then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and render to each according to all his ways whose heart you know. For you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. When we see it over and over in scripture, God, you know the hearts of all the sons of men. God, you know the heart of every one who has breath. Look at this, First Chronicles. As for you, my son Solomon, this is David, King David speaking to his son who's going to be taking over his reign as king. As for you, my son Solomon, know, this word know, it means to have a deep understanding. When you see in scripture that God knows the heart of man, it means that he has a deep understanding of what that heart is. For as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart. Solomon, you're about to take the reins. Solomon, you're about to keep, be king. Solomon, keep things in perspective and let you, with your whole heart, with everything that you've got, everything in the inner side, everything that's in the inner person, all of your emotions, all of your feelings, all of your desires, all, all of, of who you are. What's it say? Serve him with everything you've got. Talk about matters of the heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Solomon, please, your heart is everything. Let's look at this. For the Lord searches all hearts. The word search. We got the definition of search? I want you to see this. To examine intently. To know every detail. And the Bible says that God searches the heart of man. Folks, we can't hide anything from God. We can't think that we get away with this one. We can't think God didn't hear what I said. God didn't hear me in my harsh tone. God didn't hear my critical spirit. God didn't hear, God didn't hear, God didn't hear. God didn't see that. Because I look good here. No. God looks at your heart and he's examined it with great intent and great intimately. And he knows. This is what... The definition of this. He knows every detail, folks. So that should do one thing. <laughs> For me, that says, God, you're that big and you're that great. And you know my heart. And there's nothing I can do that you don't know about. There's nothing I can think that you don't know. There's nothing I can say that you didn't hear. It should bring a great reverence and a great fear of the absolute sure presence and power of God in our lives. To know that he is one who is examined intimately to every exact point of detail of who we really are. It's huge. Number two to this message is this. God looks at the heart. The question for us is what does he see? 
when we know that God searches intimately and we know that he is examining our hearts to every single point of detail, that the next logical question for me in my reasoning of scripture, God, I know that you're looking at my heart and I know that you know everything about me. God, what do you see in me? What does my heart reveal about who I am? Huge. When we, when we begin to see this in scripture and recognize Exactly why is it that God chose David? 1 Samuel 13, 14 says this. But now your kingdom shall not endure, for the Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not, he's talking to, Sam, he's talking to Saul, for you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Saul, you're out because you didn't do what I said. I am looking for a man after my own heart. This is what God is saying. I am searching for one who has a heart like mine. I am searching for one who wants what I want. This is what God is saying. Look at Acts 13, 22. We, this is so clear. After he removed him, he raised up David to be their king concerning whom he had testified and said, I have found David. After his search, he says, I have found David. I know the heart of every man that has ever walked the planet. I know the heart of every woman who's ever had breath. And he says, I have found. Incredible. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart. Why? Because he will do my will. People have brought up, there's been, been who knows how many messages in regards to why is it? What is a man after God's own heart? What does a woman look like who is after God's own heart? You, you talk about David repented and David was fearless and David was a warrior and David, because he did what God said to do. That is the one's when God looks at our heart, folks, does he see a willing people who will say, God, you've got me. I'm all in. I will do whatever you tell me to do. If I see it in scripture, God, I'll do it. If I, if I recognize that my life doesn't line up with your word, God, I'll change. Your word doesn't change. You don't change. You have set the standard from the beginning to the end. And God, I want my life, I want who I am, my heart to line up with exactly who you say that I am. Father, I want to be that one that you search and that you find that Sean is one who will be obedient. Sean is one who will do your will and not my own. When God found David and anointed him king, he said, why? It's because he wants what I want. When I tell him to do something, he'll be obedient to it. That's a man or a woman that is after God's heart. Psalm 78, please. This is huge. He also chose David, his servant, who took him from the sheepfolds. Now look at this. I went back to 1 Samuel 16. You should still be there. Now look at this. Samuel goes to the house of Jesse. The biggest and the best come before him. Not him. Second, not him. Third, not him. Fourth, not him. Fifth, not him. Sixth, not him. Seventh son comes before him. Not him. And then it stops. And I could see Samuel looking at Jesse going, I asked for all your sons. Is there anyone left? Because God hasn't anointed these, so either I missed or you missed. Well, there's one left. He's, he's got his little harp and he's playing his music out in the field and he's the shepherd boy, he's cleaning up the sheep poop. That, I guess, I mean, he's, he's the last one we got, we'll bring him out. God said he's the one right there. I'm not looking at anything else, but I'm looking at David's heart and I see that he is one who will do my will. He's one who will lay down himself for me. And he said, look at this. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfold. He took him from the shepherd boy. He took him from playing his harp in a field, looking at the stars to a place of kingship. From the care of the ewes and the suckling lambs, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded, look at this, them according to the integrity. What's the matter of his heart? From the integrity of his heart. And he guided them with his skillful hands. Gang, there is so much in this that we see the position that we think we are in or the low position that we think that we are in. And, and when we are saying, God, you know my heart, that you would put me in a place that I will be one that will obey and I will be one to honor and I will be one to do your will and I will be one to do your work your way. He can take you from any position that you are in when he sees your heart and he can promote you to where he needs you to do what he's called you to do. That's huge. 
And how did David lead out of the integrity of his heart? We know David screwed up. We know that he uh, was in some gross, gross, uh, immoral sin. But again, David showed himself as a broken man before God and understood what it was to repent and be broken and accept the consequence of sin. A lot of people have a hard time with that one, to accept the consequence of our sin. David, being a man after his own heart, understood repentance and sin and there's consequence and I accept it. And God, you are still God. That's the key. Huge, huge. When we see this and we understand this, Folks, what does he see when he sees your heart? What does he see? We, we know, God, your word is very clear that you look at all man's heart. What do you see? Folks, could you imagine being a disciple and knowing, God, there's nothing I can get away with? Could you imagine being, um, and we see some great stories where through, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see where Jesus knew, Jesus, 100% man, yet still 100% God, that Jesus knew what people were thinking. Uh, could you imagine that, being a disciple? We see it in, in Mark 9. There's a very clear picture. You've got the disciples. They begin talking, right? Jesus is ahead of them. The disciples are having this discussion amongst themselves. This is kind of towards the end. <laughs> and you can see probably Peter, because he's Peter, got a big mouth. Peter comes up and says, hey, John, <laughs> dude, I've got to be the greatest of the bunch because I walked on water. Right? I mean, come on. John, you didn't walk on water. You didn't get out of the boat, John. I walked on water. Dude, did you forget that uh, Jesus called you Satan? Did you miss? Did you forget? You may not be all that great. Right? I mean, you could imagine this discussion that's going on. Right? I mean, you could imagine even Andrew piping in, saying, you know, Peter, dude, I saw him first. I'm the one who came and said, the Messiah's here. I, you, you were so blind and you were so busy. You didn't even notice that the Messiah showed up. Remember, I had to come and get you. Peter, you know, I must be the greatest because I saw him first. Well, you know, you could see this discussion. Who knows what was being said? But the Bible says they were discussing amongst themselves who was the greatest. And, you know, maybe Thomas or Thaddeus, just because that's like a cool name, Thaddeus, right? He's like a gladiator. Maybe Thaddeus showed up and said, guys, uh, Jesus, we probably shouldn't talk about this because we, we know Jesus is the greatest servant of all, and he probably wouldn't want us to discuss who's really the greatest because we're so great. So Thaddeus, probably Thaddeus showed up and said, you guys, let's tone it down, right? And then it's great because uh, it says when they got to town, Jesus looks at them and says, hey, what were you guys talking about back there? And the Bible says they kept silent. Could you imagine that? I mean, like hand in the cookie jar, the cookie's on the face. Well, which one you got in the cookie jar? I don't know. I mean, it's like, really? And, and, then, and then it's so incredible. Could you imagine this? They didn't say a word. And Jesus sits them down and says, you know who's the greatest? The one who serves the most. I mean, could you imagine the disciples going, what? And then another great story where Jesus knows the thoughts of man. And you, ha you have this, Jesus being invited. This is Luke 7. Jesus being invited into the Pharise the, the, a Pharisee's home. And then this sinning woman, this immoral prostitute, shows up and she begins to just break down and she begins to, to rub his feet and she just shows such amazing love because she recognizes who she is and who he is. And she gets this picture and Jesus is just soaking this in. And it's just amazing of what this picture is unfolding, of the love of Christ for this immoral woman and a broken woman who recognized that he is the answer right here. And then this ridiculous religious Pharisee thinks, the Bible says he thought within himself. Now, if he was a real prophet, he's thinking this. If he was a real prophet, he'd know who this woman is. Now, the Bible, the next sentence, the Bible says, and Jesus answered him. Oh, could you imagine he's thinking this and Jesus answers his question? Listen, Simon, I know who you are, and I know what you're thinking, and I know who this woman is, and I know exactly what she's done. Let me tell you a parable. He goes into this amazing parable because he, incredible. I could imagine me, myself, the things that come across my mind at times, you know, um, in reference to bad guys at times, right? In my dislike for bad guys. And I could imagine me walking with Jesus. And here he's in front of me, right? And, I'm, and these thoughts come to me, these bad thoughts. And I could just see, I'm thinking this and I'm walking. And I could see Jesus just turn around and say, really, Sean? Oh, what? I mean, I'm thinking, man, who does he think he is? God? Oh, come on. Folks, when we really begin to realize he knows everything that comes across our mind. 
He knows everything that comes across our eyes. He knows everything in regards to who we are as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, as a husband, as a wife. We don't get away with anything. And that's good news. Now look at this. Come on, last point. Number three is this. Folks, when we realize this, and we look at these pages, and we're looking at them, and we're saying, God, I want to line up with your word. I want to see who you are in scripture. I want to, I want to read the Old Testament. I want to read the New Testament. I want to know just who I am to be. When I know that you, you intimately examine me, and you know me, and you know every detail of my life. Folks, as, as ones who have come to that point to confess him as Lord, and we recognize, Jesus, you are king, and you are God, and you are master, and I know what you've done for me. And in order for me to understand this, I am submitting to you as you are Lord. The Bible says you must confess that he is Lord. You must, you must repent, recognizing sin, and believe. In that, when we see something in Scripture, if we're going to be a man or a woman after God's own heart, the Bible says he'll do my will. He'll see Scripture, and he'll obey. You know what that means? That every one of us, from when we get saved to when we go home to heaven, that we have to be open to change. Now look at this, Psalm 78. I'm sorry, Psalm 139. I want you to see this. Psalm 139, it'll be up on the screen. Powerful, powerful Psalm from David. And he opens in one, he says this, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Now look at this, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Examine me. It's incredible. He says, try me and know my anxious thoughts. This is huge. Search me, know me, and then this is the kicker right here. Folks, this, is, um, this can be a convicting, serious moment in a believer's life when you say, God, would you try me? That's, that's one word, try me, two words, but the first one is try me. You know what that means? Prove me, God. Search me, know my heart. And prove me. That word prove me, it means when you take a metal and you boil it down and you melt it down, you are getting rid of all of the impurities so that which is left is more valuable and more useful. That can be the best process but yet a painful process when you're saying, I am open to change. God, will you boil me down? God, remove all the impurities from me. God, that I would be valuable and useful, more useful to your service that I'm submitting to you and that you would boil out all the impurities of my life. This is, look at David. What a man after God's own heart. He's saying, listen, I don't want it to be about me. God, that you would search me and that you would know me and that you would test me and that you would prove me. And whatever it takes to do that, Get the impurities out. Folks, when you are that real before God, there are times that you will go through seasons of life. And there are times you're like, what is this about? Why, why am I going through this? What's happening? Just quite possibly, God is saying, I am removing things in you that you didn't know you had. Because I want you to be so valuable and so useful. Because I see your heart and I know the good that's in there and I know that it's going to take place. He says, when you get through with this, you will be better off than when you started. And David is saying, please search me and know me and try me and prove me. Know my anxious thoughts and see. Look at what he's crying out to God and see if there's any hurtful or offensive way in me. I mean, what an awesome heart it is. What an awesome who you are to say, God, if there's anything in me that's offensive to you, show me. God, if there's anything in me that doesn't line up with who you are, God, show me if there's any impurities in me, God, that you would reveal them to me. This is what he's crying out to God. It's incredible. And see if there's any hurtful or offensive or wicked ways to me. And then he says this, lead me. God, after all that, after all that, God, that you would guide me. And God, that I would never stray off that path. Search me, know me, Prove me and see if there's anything in me that's wrong. And then, God, I want to come and I want to be led by you, not by man, not by the world. God, I want to be led by you, that you would guide me in every step. Folks, are you open to change? Are you open to change? Brennan, you can come up. Are you open to change? Father, I thank you for this morning. God, that we would be a people who would be open Knowing that you're a God who knows all things. Knowing that you're a God who searches the heart of all people. God, what do you see in us? 
Father, we want to be a surrendered bunch to you. We want to see uh, a family who comes together and says, God, it really is all about you. I belong to you. God, you know what's best for me. You know, you know what's going to take place next week. You know what's going to pl- take place next year. God, you know where I need to be. I give you my life. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. God, I am, I am ready to step in. I am ready for this point of surrender to say, God, search me and know me. Improve me. God, get out all the impurities. God, see if there's any hurtful way in me. God, see if there's anything offensive in me. And then lead me. Folks, that is a prayer of absolute surrender. That is a prayer that you are saying, God, my life is about you. I will die to myself so that I may live for you. That is something when, when, when we want to really go and increase in our faith and increase and know God on a greater level. There are levels of knowing God, folks. And those who submit to this and those who recognize the word and those who are saying, God, please, I know my heart is wicked, but Jesus, you've come into my life. I am not the same. I am different because I am saved. I am different. I am redeemed. I no longer fear death. I no longer fear hell. Jesus, you've given me the victory. Jesus, you've given me life. Jesus, you've given me joy. You've given me peace. But I want to I go deeper to say everything about me, anything that's in my heart that is an offense to you, Reveal it. What an incredible cry out to God. What an incredible cry out to God. Father, I'm asking by your Holy Spirit that you move in this place. We don't just come in to hear a good message. We don't just come in to hear great music. We come in to worship the creator of the universe and then that you would feed us your word and that we would walk out challenged, changed, and different. That we would just submit to you. That we would take this in Psalm 139. And God, that would be the heart of every one of us in this place this morning. Father, please search me. God, know me. God, do whatever it takes to take out the impurities. Whatever it takes, God. That I will even be more useful for you at the end of it. And God, if there's anything that's offensive to you and me, that it would be revealed. And then, God, that you would lead me. I know that you love me and I know that you have a plan and a purpose for my life. Get out anything that would hinder that. Purify me. And then lead me and guide me. That I will stay the course. And that I will not be shaken.